almost there. I think I'm one of the last speakers. You can do it, you can do it, you can do it. Um, before I get going, I just want to actually say thank you for having me back. Um, this morning, I was getting ready for the presentation, and I had a thought. Um, and using my mobile phone, I quickly sent a text to my mom back in New Jersey. I said, Mom, take a picture of the map that's in the kitchen. Uh, and uh, I said, I'm doing a presentation in Australia. She said, you're in Australia today? And I said, yeah. And she said, what fun. It will be like I'm there with you. And so she uh, sent me off the picture. Um, and I don't know if you can really see it. It's a little blurry. Um, and this is, the, this is the map that hangs in our kitchen at home. It still does to the day. This is uh, my view of the world. This is how I grew up. And that's with Australia in the middle. So um, I'm glad to be home. I'm glad to be back. Uh, to, you know, I don't want to give away too many of the false um, and true stories that I was just introduced with. But I did live here when I was uh, four and five years old. And ever since then, I have viewed the world this way. So it's good to be here. Um, I was going to talk about this a little bit. Uh, and then, Craig, you threw me for a little loop. So I'm going to see if I can weave in some things. The nice thing about going last, or the hard thing, is you can tie in all the themes of everything that came before you. So I'm going to try to wrap up today for us. And I was doing great right until Craig started. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to try to, to, to see if I can wrap it up. But uh, some of the themes that have come up today is how we intersect creativity with some juxtaposed ideas, uh, like consumption or consumerism, um, uh, com uh, communication, commercialism. I'm just coming up with things that begin with C, but lots of things. Um, I think uh, Patrick talked about rehearsals, and I'm going to talk about hackathons. Uh, Farah talked about APIs. I'm going to talk about collaboration. All of these things are coming together. Jonathan, you talked about liquid, and I think I'm the last thing between you and the next drink after this, so you're almost there. So I, I am going to try to bring it all together. Um, and Craig, I was trying to figure out how I can do this. Um, you talked about fast, slow food fast, I guess, with the Chipotle example. And I think what I can say about that is what I'm going to talk about today is um, thoughtful creativity fast. Um, speed to innovation is our competitive advantage. This is in PowerPoints around the world. This is spoken in boardrooms around the world. These are in annual ports around the world. It's also, as a creative person, such a curse. Like, how can I be creative or innovative under crazy time pressure? So what I'm going to do is I am going to talk a little bit about what I've learned in Silicon Valley and how I've learned to embrace my inner speed and uh, what it means to me in the creative process. So today I'm going to talk about speed and not against creativity, but speed and creativity. And I just love the keynote transition. So I think that was the fanciest I got. Um, but there you go. To do that, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about um, me. It's a topic I know a lot about. I'm going to quickly take you through uh, some of the brands I've worked with and talk about the, the pace of competition. And then what I wanted to really do is leave this day, leave something for you guys. So um, I've come up with, I don't have 10 chapters like Jonathan had this morning, but I do have a few learnings that are hopefully strategies that um, may or may not be relevant for you. They're all strategies that you've heard of, but I'm going to tell them through the lens of my world. And we'll see if uh, that does anything for us. All right, where did it begin? I'm actually uh, an agency person. How many people here are in an agency? That's what I like. All right, so I grew up in the agency world. My first job was at an agency called Shiat Day in New York. Uh, the year was 1992. It was the Barcelona Olympics. Uh, we were doing a campaign with two guys named Dan and Dave. Um, and it was a really interesting time. It was the first Olympics, actually, that dream teams were allowed in the Olympics. So all of a sudden, you went from being an amateur event to being really a professional event with a lot of marketing and advertising and branding that goes along with it. Um, this was the first Olympics. I don't know if you remember, uh, Michael Jordan actually famously chose his brand loyalty even over his national loyalty. His, um, his, uh, Uniform was made by Reebok, which was my client at the time. He famously would cover up the logo with his Nike shoes or the, the um, flag, uh, the American flag. So all of a sudden, the, the world was changing rapidly at that point, and competition in the athletic footwear um, business was pretty rampant. Um, it was so palpable that I actually went to the competition. I uh, went to Wyden and Kennedy, which uh, was Nike's agency, still is today. Uh, that's Dan and Dave up there. Um, they look the same today. Just a little less hair, except for Kennedy. Um, and there I had the good fortune of walking into a situation, a brand called Nike, um, an American brand at the time that was exporting its goods. Uh, and I was there at a time when that brand became a global company. I was there, 
So the, right around that, that red line there. I was there from, uh, this, is, this represents about um, 12 years. When I, when I got there, I think Nike, just to put it in perspective, this was in 1994. Nike was probably about $3 billion in revenue, and when I left, they were at $15 billion. And it was fast and rapid growth, and it felt wildly competitive. Um, and that was 12 years. Today, I think Nike, for perspective, is, does anyone know, maybe like $25 billion, something like that? Um, but I was with uh, these guys for about 12 years and loved it. Learned a ton about the, um, the, the good and the bad of crazy growth. From there, I went to Apple, and I've just noticed that um, Steve Jobs, I think, has been uh, represented in every presentation. So forgive me, I'm going to shamelessly do this, the same. I had the good fortune of working with him and Sam, who's in the front row here. Um, by the way, my widened days, is Sadiq here, just to bring it all around? No? Okay. Anyway, um, I was hoping to fill the room with people I've worked with. Uh, at, um, at Apple, I joined Apple in about, uh, well, I know exactly, January 2007. And I joined Apple Computer. The name was Apple Computer at the time. Um, and on day two of working there, it was Macworld 2007, and Steve announced two things. Uh, one was the iPhone, but also more significantly, he announced that they're changing the name from Apple uh, Computers to Apple Inc., signifying a new world, signifying um, a, a, um, a new era of products, a new era of growth. I was there with Apple for four years, and it went from, I don't know if you can remember this, but this is before um, even apps existed. So this was even before the iPhone. The iPhone was invented, the iPad certainly um, touch, uh, screens and touch technology, apps, what iTunes, like all sorts of things. It was crazy growth. Um, I was there for four years with Sam. I was also there for Steve's last four years, and they were crazy prolific, crazy, crazy prolific. From um, the, the story uh, at Apple, though, what's important to note is it wasn't so much the revenue as it was the adoption of technology. And a lot of you guys have seen this slide or something similar. This is Mary Meeker's um, end of year trends report. and uh, the, these stats just keep happening every year, this rapid growth. Uh, here she points out that the iPhone um, was adopted 20 times faster than the iPod, and then the iPad, again, was adopted, in terms of sales and, and units, uh, three times faster than the iPhone. So we as consumers are rapidly just taking this stuff in and using it. The story of how my mom was able to send me that photograph within you know, a minute, and I could have it in my presentation, is an example of this crazy new world that we live in, this crazy fast world we live in. So then I took a quick little uh, break. I, I went um, back to um, Levi's. I went back to uh, the apparel business, and I was super excited to be at Levi's to uh, take what was uh, becoming a brand that meant different things all over the world and consolidate it into one global brand. And we did a lot of great work and had a lot of great fun but I did have this, this itch that needed to be scratched, uh, and it had something to do with speed. And I was missing the creativity that speed requires, or I couldn't tell if I should make this slide speed that creativity requires. Um, and so when Facebook called, I took the call um, and decided that I would, I would join Facebook. Uh, to put things in perspective, uh, when I left Levi's, it was uh, roughly the same size in terms of revenue as Facebook. It took Levi's 150 years to get there. It took uh, Facebook eight years to get there. So things are moving pretty fast. Um, but again, with Facebook, I wasn't interested in the rev revenues as much as I was interested in the pace of technology that was going on. This is a, there's a few illustrations of this, but this is just one that shows uh, that what took eight years to get to one billion users, and mind you, that's done without China. Um, uh, to reference our earlier presentation. What took uh, eight years to get to one billion users um, on Facebook on the web did half of that in the mobile space. Um, Facebook was born in a college room in around 2004. Apps and mobile technology didn't come around until 2008. So just think about how fast these things are um, moving right now. And I don't know how many of you actually look at Facebook more on your desktop than your phone, but I'm imagining it's probably more on your phone. And that is the way the world is moving. Um, every day I walk into work with this sign uh, in front of me painted on the wall, move fast and break things. And this is just an attitude that we have, um, and it's not just at Facebook, but it's in most of the companies around me in Silicon Valley. Um, this is what it means to us. Moving fast enables us to build more things and learn faster. 
However, as most companies grow, they slow down too much because they're more afraid of making mistakes than they are of losing opportunities by moving slow. We have a saying, move fast and break things. The idea is that you, if you never break anything, you're probably not moving fast enough. And I just want to say this isn't about reckless speed. This is about thoughtful speed. Um, but it does mean quick innovation and quick creativity. So what I was going to talk about uh, quickly, actually, because it's all about speed, are uh, six strategies, six things that I've learned, and I'm going to talk about them through the lens of my experience. But these are all things that you guys have heard a million times. Um, but hopefully, it's something that can help you guys in your work. Um, I'm hoping I can get through this fast, because what I'd really love to do is, if everyone's game, just do a little Q&A, because we're a little tired at the end of the day. And actually, we're a small enough group that we could do that. So, um, so write down your questions. And I'll volunteer to take questions for any of our other speakers today. And I'll answer for you guys. <laughs> Great, it's interactive. Um, all right, how, how to use speed to your advantage, how to use speed creatively, uh, a few ideas of how um, I grew up and um, some of the people in this room as well. The first one is obvious, environment matters, but I'm just gonna show you some pictures. When I walked into uh, Levi's my first day, this is what I was welcomed with. I had my own office, I had my name on the door, I had a door. Uh, and I was so flabbergasted that I took a picture and sent it to my husband right away. I said, oh dear, what have I done? And I, I love my time at Levi's, but I was behind a door. Uh, this is how we worked at Apple. This is confidential. Sam, don't tell anyone I showed this picture. But this is what it looked like behind um, the walls without windows, because uh, we were dealing with confidential material. But it's all open, and we had to communicate quickly and fast. Uh, this is what my offices look like at Facebook. Uh, again, the speed to which you can get creative and strategic and thoughtful when all the people you need are around you and in spitting distance is amazing. So I imagine most of you guys work in environments like this as well. So to state the obvious, when you're starting your creative process, set yourself up and get yourself into the right environment. The next thing you do is you start creating, right? You, so, and for us in Silicon Valley, what we try to do is iterate really quickly. Uh, the first example I want to give, again, is from our days at Apple. Um, and this is, how, uh, this is how the agency had to adapt and how to work. But this is how um, we worked at Apple in marketing. Our, our week began on Wednesday. Wednesday was when we presented work. Uh, we'd present work, and right away, you'd get feedback, and it would get killed, right? Um, so what the agency did, uh, this is Media Arts Lab. They're a fabulous agency. They're part of TBWA. What they would do is then they would uh, go back and brief the whole agency on Thursday. Again, no walls. Everyone heard what was going on, whether you were a traffic manager, a producer, an assistant account executive, a creative director. Everyone gets the download at once. Briefs are remade, and then you start briefing teams that afternoon. Concepting starts on Friday or maybe Thursday night. Carries on through the weekend. First internal creative presentation happens on Monday. On Tuesday, Lee Klaus uh, still involved with looks at the work. And on Wednesday, it's back to Apple. It's presented again. So normally at an, an agency, you try to give yourself like two weeks or something to at least give yourself the space to be creative. Well, there's no none of that. <laughs> uh, and part of the speed actually took the pressure off. It's, well, you didn't have to go away and get the answer. You would, you would just think quickly, put it down on paper. Is this right? And then go back. And do it again, is this right? And so you could just you could quickly um, move through ideas and get to answers. Uh, at Facebook, we famously call these hackathons, or hack, and this is a way of working. Another really fast way of creating um, and being creative. Uh, you guys probably know this, but the, the idea here is to work in a really condensed amount of time. Uh, and what you do is you work in open spaces. You pull the people in around you. You say, I've got a problem I want to solve. Who wants to help me? You give yourself 24 hours. You code it. You make it. You test it. You run it. You present it the next morning when everyone wakes up. Or no, no one went to sleep. Sorry. And the, the best idea wins. At Facebook, we say coding wins arguments. Um, as a creative person, I cringe because I'm like, where's the emotion in that? But it's true. If you give, just like, give yourself the luxury of not too much time and um, work through it quickly and see what just resonates at the end of that 24 hours. Uh, I'm just going to reiterate what I said, but use someone else's words to do it. Uh, the hacker way is an approach to building that involves continuous improvement and iteration. Hackers believe that something uh, can always be better and that nothing is ever complete. They just have to fix it, 
often in the face uh, of people who say it's impossible um, and have to fight the status quo to do that. Now, earlier, Patrick talked about rehearsals, where you get a bunch of people in a condensed space for a short amount of time, and some of the best work comes when there's adversity. So this is, this is the same principle. And again, I'm sure you guys do this at work every day. Uh, OK, so once you've iterated quickly, then what you have to do is you actually have to break it down again and simplify it. Uh, Sam, you'll appreciate this. This is what we walked into at Apple every day. Uh, this was on our wall. And uh, the principle here was make something and then simplify it. And once you think you've simplified it, simplify it again. And once you've done that, do it again. And, and you get them down to just the basics. Um, I think one of the biggest gifts I got from my time at Apple was the, um, the art of editing and just really synthesizing down what is important to the user, what is important to that consumer, what is the purest articulation of that message. And that is really hard to do. Um, everyone has been quoting Steve, so I'm not going to. Um, but I will uh, give you an example of how this manifests just recently for us at Facebook. Um, we, we have been building this thing over eight years now, and it's actually gotten a little complicated. So just re recently, we, we announced a redesign. Um, the nice thing about this, by the way, shout out uh, the designer who did this for Facebook is an Australian, um, Robin Morris. And uh, so this was his fine work. Um, but I'm using this, the new redesign now. And it's just so much more functional, you know? This is, this is the ultimate example of less is more. Um, so again, in all of your work, iterate quickly, and then once you get there, just break it again and simplify it. Um, here's an interesting one that might be specific to our world, but I'm just going to bring it up because it's, a, um, it's something unique, I think. And that is to collaborate, to compete. Uh, our version of the paparazzi in Silicon Valley is actually like TechCrunch or Engadget. They go around looking for uh, pictures of celebrities. These are our celebrities. This is a picture of Eric Schmidt of Google having a meal with um, Steve Jobs uh, immediately after Steve was famously said, you know, mentioning that Google was the ultimate enemy uh, and was you know, evil uh, to the core. The, the point here is that in Silicon Valley, often what you do is you actually collaborate with your enemy because they may have technology that you really need. We saw that within the, um, in your example with the APIs, where you take two companies that may be competing, but they realize that they can better their um, experience to their users by coming together. Um, this, uh, an article recently by Thomas Friedman, who's an op-ed writer uh, for the New York Times and also has written some famous books. Uh, he recently wrote an article about um, collaboration and the difference between what it means in Washington, D.C. and what it means in Silicon Valley. And there's two definitions in the, in the dictionary. One is a more artful definition of collaboration, uh, and one is about working with the enemy. Um, and he says here that it's interesting in Silicon Valley that collaboration is defined as something you do with another colleague or a company to achieve greatness. But in Congress, collaboration means something very different. It's the second definition. It's an act of treason, something you do when, you're, when you cross over and vote with the other party. In Silicon Valley, great collaborators are prized, and in Washington, they are hanged. Now, those are two extreme examples, but I also I challenge you guys to think about how you think of your competition in your business, whether it is your, uh, a competitor or another agency or another art form or another anything, um, uh, sometimes the best way forward is to come together and collaborate with what seems like a total opposite idea. The other way to do it is if someone's doing it better, to acquire them. And here's a, an example from Facebook. And this happens a lot in our business, where someone is doing something really great. And this quote here is actually from Mark again, talking about um, Instagram. And his point was that they were doing photographs almost better than Facebook was. And that was our, uh, the thing that we started. And so instead of getting angry about it and spending all your energy like fighting the competition, we just acquired them. Uh, I love this picture because <laughs> um, this, is, this is a picture of their first day walking into Facebook. And they, you know, they're just like, oh my god, what have we done? Uh, but we are learning so much from them, and vice versa. We're all now one. Uh, but the point, point being is uh, you know, understand your weak spot, and then just go for it. Second to last one is fail harder and fail smarter. Uh, this is a concept that we've heard a lot about today, gets talked about a lot, the importance of risk taking, the importance of failure. 
I did want to bring it up again um, because there was an interesting, oh, this is something else, you know, we've got lots of <laughs> um, stuff on our walls. You guys should all come visit, uh, just to remind us every day. Um, but the, the reason I wanted to talk about this again is um, Alan Noble is uh, Google Australia's engineer director. He spoke about a year ago. I don't know if any of you guys were there, or a year and a half ago. And he, he talked specifically about the clash of uh, cultures of Silicon Valley and Australia. And he said, you can't innovate without failure. Um, and he talked about how that was actually hard, um, a hard lesson here to learn. So I'm going to reiterate it, uh, that you can't <laughs> innovate without failure. Uh, something we say a lot in Silicon Valley is this idea, failure is just another word for experience. Um, and so maybe, maybe culturally we get a pass more than you guys do. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't all keep trying. So for us, uh, it's really important to fail, to fail quickly, to fail thoughtfully, and to fail smart. Um, the point about failure for us isn't about what you've lost, it's actually about what you gained, what lessons you gained from that experience. Um, I'm gonna give a, a, a very public recent example of this uh, from Facebook's uh, playbook again. Um, if you didn't know, we went public this past year, and uh, um, when you fail in your small private company or you fail as an individual, uh, it's pretty easy, no one really needs to know, and you can make a mental note of your lessons and then move on. It's harder when it's done very publicly. Um, but this is a story I wanna talk about of mobile. Uh, this is um, the first speaking engagement after we were, uh, went public. There's like a dark period, you can't talk for a while. And the first time that Mark went up on stage, uh, he talked about our failure in the mobile space. The headline all over the, he talked about lots of things. He actually talked about Search, which is a new product that's just come out. He's talked about a lot of really good stuff, but what everyone heard was, uh, and the headlines all said, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's biggest mistake. And as a company, we did this on purpose and went out there publicly with a story. And here's the story, uh, as we have referenced now, mobile technology is, um, and especially in, in this world, kind of came along in about 2008 with apps. Um, and it's not that long ago. Right away, uh, Facebook knew that that was gonna be crucial to the business model. If in fact, um, we are gonna connect the world, our mission is to uh, make the world more open and connected, we were gonna need mobile technology. And there's a debate going on at the time about whether or not to use uh, HTML5 or do native apps. A lot of that was sparked by um, actually Apple themselves uh, who are pushing uh, HTML5. Um, and HTML5 is great, it's faster, um, it happens in a cloud, so for us at Facebook it means that we, Facebook on our servers would do all the work and it should make for a faster mobile experience for you. Native apps are you download an app and you put it on your device. So we put all of our bet on HTML5 and we changed our organization and any engineer who was previously working on say Android had to learn a whole new code, had to learn a whole new system and we tried this for about a year and it wasn't happening. If anyone had, um, I don't know if you guys can remember because you just get used to the, the most recent thing but um, Facebook apps were really slow like a year ago even, not that long ago. So um, we were trying, we were trying, it was a good idea, but that technology was just a little bit ahead of our, of our time. Um, so what we had to do is right around this time, just right when we were coming, becoming public, um, Mark got up in front of the company and said, I made a mistake. Um, we're not gonna do HTML5, we are gonna restructure again and we're gonna go back to native apps because that's the right thing to do for our users right now and uh, native apps will move a lot faster and give them a better experience. Uh, so um, we had to break the machine again, break the organization, restructure. If you're an engineer who had just learned how to do HTML5, you now had to learn how to do iOS or Android or some combination thereof. Um, and then we had to uh, you know, publicly come out and say, listen, we made a mistake. But what was important to us, and this is something that we pride ourselves on, are talking about these mistakes, what was important to us is that without that failure, we wouldn't have advanced. We actually, all of our engineers are now um, multilingual. They can code in anything. We're taking a lot of what we learned from HTML5 and now putting it into the native apps. Uh, this morning, if you read the geeky tech news, you saw that uh, we announced something called a beta club, which means, anyway, it's too much information, but we, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> um, but what we're, we're taking some of our learning, again, from that experience, from that mistake, uh, and building a better experience for our users. So, point being is that uh, failure is wildly important to the advancement and to the speed at which we can compete. 
but it doesn't mean, oh, that's to represent mobile. Um, there you go, picture of a phone. That's a picture of uh, my friend Chris Riley's uh, photograph, uh, who I get to see from all over the world because of mobile. Okay, so the last thing is we've talked about the environment, we've talked about it, um, creating quickly and iterating, we've talked about then simplifying, we've talked about failing and breaking. None of that means anything if you didn't learn from it, and you have to learn publicly. You have to create a culture of learning, and this is something that um, I felt like uh, I really learned how to do at both Apple and Facebook. Uh, again, you don't have any time to have a bruised ego. You have to get out there right away and just say, okay, wh what, did I, what did I learn from that and how am I going to advance? Um, I recently was visiting the guys at Media Arts Lab, um, and they, what the, uh, the, so that's Apple's agency, and what they were saying is that they are now going back and documenting all the stories that they can remember from the last 10 years. They weren't doing their lessons learned yet. They just wanted to document the stories. Because if they could document the stories, then they could look back and say, oh yeah, I remember that late night, or remember when we did that, or remember when we messed up there. And they would learn from that. Uh, the same thing happens at Facebook every day and every week. We, uh, as part of our culture, we have a Q&A every Friday with the whole company. Uh, no matter where you are in the world, you actually satellite in, and um, Mark will take questions, any question, from anyone about anything. And it's become a game to try to trip him up um, and to try to ask the hardest questions. And they're usually questions like, why did you, excuse my language, but why did you fuck up when you did that? Or well, how could you say that so publicly? Or why did you do that? And that just constant openness and discussion and learning is what helps us advance. And we do this every week. Uh, it happens faster in smaller groups as well, but as a company we do this out loud um, and we do it on a regular basis. So um, those are a few of uh, the tricks I've learned and that's how I've learned to embrace speed and why I probably can't go back. Uh, and um, now I'd love to if we have, we have tons of time. Uh, if anyone wants to ask questions of me or anyone else. <laughs>